more about Joseph Smith's many plural wives next on Polygamy, What Love Is This? She was born into polygamy. Her family followed the teachings of Joseph Smith, including plural marriage. Like many young girls, she had been promised to a man who was her father's age, but she ran away. That girl was me. I was lost. Then Jesus Christ found me. I found real freedom. He is a shield to all who will take refuge in Him. We continue to tell the stories of Joseph Smith's many plural wives, and we use information that perhaps our viewers may not have been aware of, or many LDS that remain in denial of these many plural marriages of their prophet Joseph Smith. The information that we use is not propaganda or anti-Mormon stories, but we, are uses, we use documented historical information with all the footnotes and data available from diaries and journals and legal documents and news articles of that day. 99 or percent or more of the information we gather is from authentic Mormon sources. This time we're going to tell the stories of Joseph Smith's 26th and 27th plural wives. Now the 26th wife of Joseph Smith was Hannah S. Ells, and we are taking her story from In Sacred Loneliness beginning on page 535. Oh. Hannah Ells was a dressmaker and a hat maker. She was an experienced seamstress who had worked for fashionable French establishments in Philadelphia. She's one of the more obscure wives of Joseph Smith. Not much is known about her, so her story will be a short one, and neither is her story full of, of tragedy or abuse or neglect like so many of Joseph That's Smith's awesome. pedophile actions were was in, in other of uh, the stories of his uh, plural wives. In fact, her marriage was relatively uncomplicated. She married Joseph Smith when she was 30 years old, uh, and she had not uh, previously been married, nor was she married to another man at the same time as she was married to Joseph Smith, as 11 of his <laughs> other wives had been. Hannah was born in England in 1813, and history reveals that she only had one sibling, a brother named Josiah. Few details are known about ha <coughs> Hannah's early life. She immigrated to America and lived in Philadelphia for several years. And she opened up a, an establishment where she made dress make, where she uh, worked in dressmaking. And it's assumed that Hannah lived with her brother Josiah during that time. In 1838, Josiah joined the Mormon Church after he had heard Orson Pratt and Benjamin Winchester preach Mormonism in New Jersey. He read the Book of Mormon and was converted. I wish she had read the Bible and got <laughs> yeah, converted there instead. Nice. It's likely, but it's not known for sure, that Hannah was converted at the same time her brother was, and Josiah was called to be a presiding elder in a Mormon branch in New Jersey. And in 19, or 1840, uh, she met Joseph Smith for the first time when he traveled east. And their first meetup would have been at a time when Joseph Smith was preaching a powerful warning to people against shedding Mormon blood. We <laughs> quote from In Sacred Loneliness. Yeah, on page 536, Smith preached powerfully, warning the inhabitants of the nation against shedding the blood of the saints and the consequences to themselves and the entire nation unless they desisted. If they did not, he prophesied, they should see blood and much sorrow. Well, that <laughs> that was a false prophecy too, wasn't it? Yeah. And obviously anti-Mormon sentiment was building, mm -hmm. sometimes to the point of a violent level. Well, Joseph Smith counseled Josiah uh, to gather to Nauvoo with the rest of the mornings, Mormons, which he did, and obviously taking Hannah with him. Hannah became part of the historical record when she placed an advertisement for her dressmaking skills in the Times and Season Mormon newspaper. She also joined the inner circle of important Mormon women when she joined the Relief Society in June of 1842. Um, and it's interesting to note that during 1842 and 1843, Joseph Smith married 28 oh. of his plural wives wow. in that two-year period of time. And that's, that's a, that one year or so Those period. two years, two the, years. 1842 oh. and 1843. And of course, Hannah fits in yeah. this timeline. Right. Uh, sometime before the, the summer of 1843, Hannah became a plural wife of Joseph Smith. Now, like we said, no details are known except that Mastor, uh, Mormon historian Andrew Jensen gives the year of their marriage and 
uh, there is an affidavit showing that Hannah and Joseph were married before the summer of that year. Hannah was living in the home of a man named John Benbow, and he wrote the following. Hannah L. Smith, the wife of the prophet, boarded in his house two months during the summer of the same year, 1843, and said Hannah E. Smith also lived at his house several months in 1844 after the prophet's death. And further, that President Smith frequently visited his wife Hannah at his house. Aside from this bare notice, little is known of Hannah's marriage. And so we notice that Hannah assumed the last name of Smith. Yeah. And other than this, there is so very little known of her marriage. But by this, we also know that there were conjugal uh, relations between Smith and Hannah, that he did have uh, marital time with uh, Joseph Smith. We also have a quote from a book entitled Nauvoo Polygamy. In another affidavit, John Benbow affirmed that in summer 1843 at his home, just outside of Nauvoo, Joseph came to speak to him and his wife together and brought Hiram with him. After telling John and Jane about the doctrine of celestial marriage or plurality of wives, Joseph, <clears throat> Joseph arranged to use the Benbow home for intimate visits with one of his wives, Hannah Ells, who lived with the Benbows. So again, we have another uh, a, a part that we can refer to where he did have conjugal yeah. relations with his plural yeah. wives. She was also involved with and solicited donations for the Relief Society. And she's described as being a very tall woman with a striking figure. Joseph Smith was killed on June 27th of 1844, which made Hannah a widow at 31 years old. And she was also a very close friend of the Wilford Woodruff family. Her name is found frequently in his journal. Her brother Josiah left the Mormon church and joined with William Marks uh, because he opposed the 12 in their claim to be the authoritative oh. church leaders after Smith's death. So, you know, there was that leadership Brian. problem going on at that time. So Jos uh, Josiah eventually joined the RLDS church. And Hannah drops out of the historical record at that time until her death. And it also is not very well documented, we quote. Then she drops out of the historical record until her death, which itself is poorly documented. She apparently died later in 1845, but we have no date or cause of death. Perhaps malaria finally claims her. Well, Mormon historian Andrew Jensen said that Hannah was a lady of culture and refinement and that those who knew her spoke very well of her uh, being a very good and noble woman. She was respected and influential in the circles of elite women in Nauvoo. We're glad to tell the story <laughs> of one of his wives where little negativity is attached to the messiness of what Joseph Smith's polygamy usually was. In fact, the next wife, wife number 27, mm -hmm. is, is almost the same. She's an older woman, and there's very little negativity attached oh, to that marriage either, right. except that she <laughs> is married to two men at the same time. Uh -huh. And other than that, it's a pretty, um, pretty clean, <laughs> if you can use that word, uh, uh, historical record. So we go to wife number 27 now. She was a woman who was the Relief Society treasurer. Her name was Alvira Annie Cowles Home. Smith, that's quite a name to be carrying yes, around. It is. <laughs> She's described as being a, a quiet, gentle, trustworthy friend of Emma Smith. <clears throat> she was the daughter of Nauvoo State Presidency Councilor Austin Cowles. Now we learn quite a bit about her father who was adamantly against polygamy as we tell Elvira's story, but it's important to know about this in the story of Elvira and Joseph Smith. Elvira had lived as a maid and, and a nanny in Joseph Smith's home, so both Emma and Joseph knew her very well. Many of the Smith's household helpers ended up in his bed as a plural wife, if you haven't noticed that in yeah, our, I've noticed that as we go on. Common thread there. <laughs> and almost so many of them. Yeah. Uh, Elvira was born November 23rd of eight, in 1813 in New York, and her father, Austin, was a school teacher. He was a minister, a clerk, a wheelwright, and a small farmer. He was well educated and he took religion very seriously. Her mother, Phoebe, died in 1826 when Elvira was only 12 years old and her father remarried 
and her new stepmother was only five years older than Elvira was, mm. so she was raised by a stepmother, and then later she became a stepmother herself. Very little else is known of her early years, uh, and as she grew into young woman, except that she became a school teacher at a very early age. The official date of Mormonism's founding is April 6th of 1830. Now, most of the Cowles family converted soon after that date. They came to Kirtland, Ohio in 1836, and again, there's very little known written history about her life in Kirtland. However, that's where she must have first met Joseph Smith. Uh, <clears throat> she also met many of the young women who would become <laughs> later on <laughs> her, her sister wives later on, and that would yeah. be Zena and Prezindia Huntington, Eliza Snow, Miranda Hyde, and Agnes Coolbrith Smith were some of those young women. Uh, when they decided to move Zion to Missouri, both her father and her future husband, Jonathan Holmes, signed the official rules in favor of the move. So they were two important people in early Mormon history. After a 700-mile journey, they arrived in October, on October 2nd. They continued on, and I hope I say this right, they continued on to Adam on Diamond. Is that how you say that? Adam on Diamon is, Ammon? I think, the way it's we kind of said it. Uh, Adam, Adam on, on Diamond. And, and that's where they pitched their tents. So we have a quote. Of Adam on Diamon. Yeah, that's. <laughs> we quote As they camped, one of the brethren living in the place proclaimed with a loud voice, Brethren, your long and tedious journey is now ended. You are now on the public square of Adam on Diamond. This is the place where Adam blessed his posterity when they rose up and called him Michael, the prince, the archangel, and he, being full of the Holy Ghost, predicted what should befall his posterity to the latest generation. Now, I find this kind of thing very interesting because they're all myths. The Mormon stories around all this, and, and, and even this, yeah. is, is just definitely a myth. Adam isn't Michael. No. He's not the archangel. <laughs> the Garden of Eden wasn't there, you know. The, but those were all the Mormon traditions. At so least. The tradition. Were they the same? In the, in the I public? didn't hear about Adam on Daimon or, or Ammon, but we were told that when Jesus comes back, we will go to Missouri. And I think it was Independence, Missouri, but I'm well, not positive. And this is where Adam on Diamond is. Is it's around right, the Independence? Right near Independence, Missouri. Okay, so that is. And there was prophecy that there was an altar there of Adam's, and that mm -hmm. this is where he prayed the Garden of Eden, and this is where he uh, all what's, what's, offered sacrifice to God. And <laughs> what's interesting about that, as the Bible show, tells us four rivers that came from the Garden of Eden, yeah. and the Tigris and Euphrates River are two of them. Are they in Missouri? <laughs> no. I think we know where they're at. Yeah. So, you know, the, and the Bible tells us clearly to avoid myths, yeah. and these are simply myths. Anyway, the Garden of Eden location couldn't be there, and Adam isn't who they say he was either. Well, just to throw it in real quick, we, we go with this, the earth was divided during the days of Peleg. That's mm -hmm. kind of how the Mormons explain that separation. The Tigris and Euphrates somehow were probably over here at one point. <laughs> and when the days of Peleg oh, separated, yeah? I, uh, that's at least some discussion that's okay. been out there. Okay, well, that's <laughs> not quite how it no, worked, but sure it we'll, isn't. <laughs> we'll let them believe their myths. We hope they don't. We want them to believe the truth. Anyway, later on, they moved to Illinois. Of course, that would be Nauvoo. Her father, Austin, was selected to serve as first counselor to the president of the Nauvoo stake, and we quote, Austin attended high council meetings where he cho shows up frequently in the minutes. Elvira, now 27, would thus gain some visibility as the daughter of a prominent church leader. She lived in Joseph Smith's household for a time, as did many of Smith's wives. In the spring of 1840, she became a member of the family of the prophet Joseph Smith, where she remained a happy inmate <laughs> until her marriage to Holmes. I thought that was an interesting, <laughs> interesting choice of words there. <laughs> Inmate. <laughs> Elvira became a close friend of Emma Smith, and she also became friends with other leading women of Nauvoo, including the Partridge sisters, who were doomed to be numbered <laughs> among Joseph Smith's plural wives, who were also living in her home. And they called themselves Emma's friends, and yet behind her back, they oh, married no. her husband. Because Elvira was living with the Smith family, she met several important leaders or future leaders in the church, and one of them was her husband-to-be, and his name was Jonathan Holmes. 
this would be another marriage where a married woman living with her husband also became a polygamous wife of Joseph Smith. It's called polyandry, but the Bible calls it adultery. <laughs> Elvira had two living husbands. Jonathan Holmes was a handyman. He was also one of Joseph Smith's bodyguards and a shoemaker by profession. He was well liked by many people, including Joseph Smith, and he was a widower with a daughter named Sarah Elizabeth. And while Elvira was living in Joseph Smith's home, she was given charge of this little girl, Sarah. And it was about the same time that Jonathan and Elvira began their courtship. Now, Elvira lived with the Smiths from 1840 until 1842 at the same time as the Partridge sister and Desdemona Fulmer, all of whom eventually became plural wives of Joseph Smith. She was one of 20 women who attended the first Relief Society meeting and was selected to be their treasurer about this time time, Emma chose to invite Eliza Snow to come and live in her home, and she used Elvira as her messenger for that, we quote. She was not outgoing or charismatic, but rather was quiet, trusted, and valued. Emma used Elvira as a messenger on August 14 when she sent her to invite Eliza Snow into the Smith household. Now, we get kind of a confusing turn of events as this goes, but it's part of the story, so we're going to tell it. Yeah. Elvira was sent to invite Eliza Snow to live in the Smith's home along with several other women at the same time, most of them Joseph Smith's plural wives. Eliza moved in four days after she received Emma's invitation, but Emma could not have known that Eliza had married Joseph Smith two months earlier than that. And during her stay, Emma discovered the plural marriage relationship between Joseph and Eliza, and to top it off, Eliza became pregnant. <laughs> we quote from In Sacred Loneliness. Now, this is on page 314. In Eliza's diary, we find only the following on February 11, 1843. Took board and had my lodging removed to the residence of Brother Jonathan Holmes. And a number of other sources point to a conflict between Eliza and Emma that caused the separation from the Smiths. And Emma thought that Joseph's polygamy was a thing of the past. Probably promised that. Uh -huh. At the time of the blow up and that when she discovered as Eliza's relationship with him, according to this scenario, a violent scene was inevitable. I can imagine. <laughs> In Eliza's journal, she wrote on December 12, 1842, about her delicate condition, which was a 19th century euphemism for pregnancy. Yeah. Yeah. And there was an angry altercation in which accounts say that Emma pushed Eliza down the stairs. She lost her baby. She injured her hip. And afterwards, she always favored the leg of the oh. hip that she injured. After Elvira married Jonathan, she was also involved with Eliza Snow in her removal from Joseph Smith's home after the altercation with Emma. Now, it's interesting that Elvira was caught up in the middle of Eliza's and Emma's disagreement, and especially ironic since Elvira later became a plural wife of Joseph Smith as well. In September of 1842, Elvira and Jonathan Holmes were engaged. They were married on December 1st with Joseph Smith performing the ceremony. We quote, According to an affidavit she signed in Utah in 1869, Elvira was sealed to Joseph Smith in June 1, 1843, in Heber C. Kimball's house, with Heber officiating and Violet Kimball and Eliza Partridge standing as witnesses. So there you go. <laughs> <laughs> now, the fact that Joseph Smith and Elvira's husband were close friends and associates uh -huh. in the Mormon religion indicates Jonathan must have known that Smith was married to his wife and permitted it. Yeah. Now, if he wasn't present at their plural marriage ceremony, he was probably aware of it at least sooner than later because later he stood proxy for Joseph Smith when his wife was married to him for eternity in the Nauvoo Temple. Oh and that alone shows that he knew of her polyandrous marriage, at least at that time. Hmm. However, these goings on caused quite a problem with Elvira's father, we quote. Yeah, this first husband never wavered in his loyalty to the Mormon leader. 
but else Elvira fa Elvira's father did, and it is possible that her polyandrous marriage to Smith helped bring Austin Cowell's disaffection. Even if he had not been told of the sealing, rumors of polygamy were rife in Nauvoo, and he surely would have surely had heard his da own daughter's name mentioned. One wonders if he confronted Elvira or her secret husband directly. As so often, the limited documentation for Nauvoo polygamy only leaves us with more questions. Yeah. <laughs> Lots of questions. In early 1843, several men became outspoken opponents of Joseph Smith's behavior, and among them was Elvira's father, Austin Cowles, as well as William Marks and William Law. Their opposition was public, and when Hiram Smith read Section 132, The Revelation on Polygamy, her father realized he could not condone plural marriages, so he could not function as a Mormon church leader. He resigned as counselor to the president. Of wow. course, Joseph Smith denounced the men who denounced his doctrine of polygamy. A little courage of there. Of course he did. <laughs> Ebenezer Robinson later wrote that Austin was far more outspoken and energetic in his opposition to that doctrine of polygamy than almost any other man in Nauvoo. He no longer held a prominent place in the church, although morally and religiously speaking, he was one of the best men in the place. That's saying quite yeah, a bit for yeah. him, isn't it? And we, we have another quote from him later about him. As April ended in 1844, the anti-polygamy dissenters began organizing a new church, and William Law was appointed president, and he selected Austin Cowles as his first counselor. Elvira's father was then considered a Mormon apostate. Oh, boy. Her father also helped write the first and only issue of the Nauvoo Expositor, which led to Joseph Smith's arrest, imprisonment, and eventual death. However, Jonathan Holmes, Elvira's plural husband, helped destroy <laughs> the Expositor that led to her hus other husband's death. Oh, this gets confusing. So Elvira Holmes was torn between the father she loved, who had left Mormon church, and Jonathan Holmes, who was her plural husband, who loved the church. Well, her love and her admi admiration for her father was not diminished, even though he rejected Joseph Smith and his polygamy. <laughs> Elvira continued to love, admire, and respect her father. And we would wish that today's Mormons and polygamists would have that same attitude yeah. and continue to love and respect people that um, that don't, don't believe the way they believe yeah. or, or choose to leave. But you know how difficult that would be for her father to see her married to two, have two husbands. And know it's not right. Uh-huh, and know it's not <laughs> right. right. If you remember earlier, we mentioned that he took his religion seriously. Right. And uh, which tells me that, and what Ebenezer Robinson said about him, that he had a, a high character, high integrity. Yeah. Uh, in his lifestyle. In fact, we have another quote this from Ebenezer really Robinson yeah. evaluating his character. From page 551. A man of intelligence and sincere religious conviction, he profoundly disagreed with Smith's polygamy and polyandry, and his honest required, honesty required him to openly oppose it. Some expressed their loyalty to Mormonism by following Smith without questioning, while Austin expressed his loyalty to the faith by rejecting polygamy and dissenting. He had the courage to yeah, do it. He did. Unfortunately, he ended up becoming closely associated with the reorganized Latter-day Saint Church, or oh. the RLDS, which ironically uh, denied that Joseph Smith ever practiced polygamy. And of course, the RLDS, just like the LDS, they choose to believe myths about Joseph Smith yeah. rather than to take his history uh, as it has been recorded. Now, Elvira was eternally sealed to Joseph Smith, so it left her husband, Jonathan, without her as his eternal companion, according to Mormonism. Yeah, but he fixed that by getting sealed to his <laughs> deceased wife. And Elvira stood proxy for her in the oh, in really? the ceiling. So <laughs> it's strange events and strange practices and rituals that that were made up. They didn't come from God. And God did warn us, we mentioned earlier, about believing in myths. Yeah. And there's so many of them that surround uh, this religion and both polygamous and Mormonism. Well, Elvira went to Salt Lake City with the rest of the Mormons 
and they settled in Farmington where they built a two-story rock building and worked a dairy farm and produced um, cheese and butter. And she became a plural wife again when her husband married a 45-year-old widow named Sarah. Hmm. Um, and again, it makes you wonder because there's no documents that reveal the relationship between these two women, but it makes you wonder how she, because she had married yeah. two men right. and, and her husband allowed it. Now he's married to two women, and it makes Apparently you wonder she, how she, if she allowed it or not. Or, yeah, how that all worked out. Yeah. But there's there's no documents that reveal yeah. any information about that. It seems Elvira's experiences with polygamy were not traumatic. At least there's no documentation of it. However, her father's experiences with even the idea of polygamy were traumatic and life changing mm -hmm. for him. Do we know if he came to Utah, or did he die? Or well, he joined the RLDS, so I yeah. doubt if he did, oh, he because did. they yeah. they totally That's reject true. the they Mormon, the yeah. Salt Lake Mormons. That's true. Um, and and we're not told history doesn't tell us either how Jonathan felt about polygamy, <laughs> about his wife having plural husbands. Yeah, it, it just talks about what they did, and there didn't seem to be any argument <laughs> between them. Um, we also have to remember that Elvira and Hannah's plural marriages experiences were not the norm. <laughs> uh, hers were radically different than most of Joseph Smith's wives and even other polygamists at the time. And you know, we've done, what, 27 of his plural wives yeah, now? That's right. And each one, one by one, and most of them have quite a bit of odd <laughs> traumatic events taking place. Uh, in the marriages, or even coming up to the marriages. Elvira died at age 57 at March 10th of 1871. The cause of her death was tuberculosis. She was buried in a Farmington cemetery. And so this does complete the mm. story of Joseph Smith's 26th and 27th plural wives. And Now you mentioned, uh, you've mentioned before, I think, that the, the trend or the, the way that uh, they would send women out to to in, encourage other women to come mm -hmm. in and be plural marriages. Mm -hmm. Sounds like that's what happened here. Do you think when they, when she went out and got it, got Eliza Snow to, um, to join? I I don't know. That's an interesting question. Can you talk her I into I it didn't or? see any reference to that at all oh. in the information I read. But that doesn't mean that it couldn't have happened. But but you've seen that right? Where mm -hmm. I guess other women. Um, try to sell the idea to the other Eliza ladies. Snow was one of them who did. Yeah. Um, oh, I can't remember her name right now. We talked about her before. Oh, her name skips me though, but she definitely was Percent. one that, um, and she was an older yeah. older woman, older than Smith was when she, he married her. That wasn't that Prescindia, was it? Uh -huh. okay. No, it wasn't her. Darn, I wish but I could remember her name. Somebody that would go out and... And encourage the women to join up. <laughs> Joseph Smith would say, I've got, I've got my eye on this girl. And you so go, she would go to go her, her and convince her. So uh, that's uh, that's closing up on more of his wives. Yeah, We're getting to the getting end here. The end. <laughs> Thanks, Earl. I, I appreciate it. We'll yeah. see you next time. Okay. Um, <clears throat> we do close our shows uh, with comments that reflect trust in the Bible and, and trust in God and trust in Jesus Christ as our only Savior. Uh, polygamy and Mormonism as religions lift up men and men's words and behaviors and present them as examples uh, for us to follow. They even use men from the Bible to dictate the practice of polygamy. But Christians are not supposed to follow the behaviors of men. Uh, men's behavior cannot dictate doctrine. In fact, Jesus rebukes the religious leader of his day for following the traditions of men. Yet that's precisely what's happening in our culture of Mormonism, including polygamy, especially polygamy. But our standard is God alone. Our behavior should be based on God's word in the Bible alone, not on what people did, but on what God said people should do. And our Savior is not polygamy or a church. It is Jesus Christ and Him alone. Thanks for watching.